It's six o'clock in London, and we're clearly not there. It's 1 p.m. in New York. I don't think we're there either. It's 1 a.m. in Hong Kong. Definitely far too sunny. Well, 3 a.m. in Sydney. What, middle of the night? That's not where we are at the moment, although it could have palm trees. 10 a.m. in San Francisco. Well, we could be getting closer, but actually we're geographically some way distant. And 10.30 at night in Mumbai. Clearly not there either. Greetings. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are in the world today. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Patrick L. Young. The new series, IPO Vid Live stream series eight episode one this is number 43 starts here now before we get to our wondrous guest today which is absolutely sensational let me just make a personal announcement absolutely ecstatic that we could put the news on rns yesterday that valerian blockchain of which you know i'm an executive director has an option to acquire the gibraltar stock exchange we're working on the closing of that transaction as we speak but in the meantime, I happen to be on my travels. As you know, from two weeks ago, I was in Nassau in the Bahamas. If you haven't watched it, go look at that fabulous discussion of the future of SME funding with the magnificent DRC Ramming Sr., who's doing so much work with the Arawak X Exchange, which, by the by, I happen to be very proudly an advisor of. Since we last saw you, we had a magnificent conference in Nassau. We had the 100 socially distanced people that you're allowed to have in a ballroom these days in COVID times, and also well over 450 figures of people watching live for two fantastic keynotes. You can catch those on the interweb too. One of them by my good self talking about exchanges and the advantages therein, and the other by the wondrous and incredible, and she's in the gallery this evening, Mrs. Young, whose PhD will be coming from this sunny locale as well tomorrow. So where are we? Well, we're not in Nassau anymore. We've actually moved to Providencialis in the Turks and Caicos Islands, and their trademark is beautiful by nature. If somebody would like to email us with any degree of proof that they can find that this is not beautiful by nature, I will be very, very excited to tell you. So that leaves us with our guest today, ladies and gentlemen, and we are ecstatic because this is history being made. We are recording this show today, a couple of hours before our live time when you'll be able to catch it, and you're now watching on YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn, with Crypto Dad Christopher Giancarlo, the Honorable J. Christopher Giancarlo. And today's the day, ladies and gentlemen, he's returned for IPO Vid when his book is published. It's in the stores right now. It's shipping. Reviews are starting to come through. I have read it. It is magnificent. But actually, let's get to the 13th chairman of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, the Honorable J. Christopher Giancarlo. He's senior counsel to the international law firm Wilkie Farr and Gallagher. As we know, we had a great discussion about the world of the blockchain and much more with him just a couple of months ago. He's a co-founder of the Digital Dollar Project, the not-for-profit initiative to advance exploration of a U.S. central bank digital currency. And as I say, here we are. Crypto Dad, the fight for the future of money, has been released today, October the 26th, 2021, by John Wiley and Sons. Thanks to the great PR team, by the way, for all the backup in preparing for this event. Christopher, now, where in the world are you today? Patrick, great to be with you. Gosh, I wish I was with you, but uh, <laughs> I'm just outside New York City in Burton County, and it's, it's, it's a leafy, uh, somewhat wet autumn day here, but toasty warm inside my home study and it's great to be visiting with you and I feel the sunshine and the warm breeze is blowing across the the zoom screen so it's <laughs> terrific to be back with you today and it's as you mentioned it's a day I'm very excited about because it's the day that my new book is being released and uh, I'm so excited about talking to you about it this morning it's absolutely marvelous. I, I really was delighted to get a galley proof a, a few weeks ago. I, I noticed actually one of the things that impressed me about the Gallic proof was they'd marked the copyright as 2022. And I thought that was only appropriate that you should be given, you should be published in the future because this is we're a book. projecting into the future. That's what we're all doing here, projecting into the future. So tell us, tell us a little bit about Crypto Dad. Give us a high level view. Well, so, so, you know, Patrick, I wrote the book to kind of get across to just ordinary people. You know, when you write a book, the first thing you have to decide is who are you writing for? And my, my, my editor said to me, are you writing for people inside the beltway? Are you writing for people outside? The, who, are you, who are you writing for? And at the end of the day, I'm writing, for, I'm writing for my neighbors. I'm writing for my friends. I'm writing for everyday people. I'm writing for cashiers in supermarkets. I'm writing for uh, the, you know, the dentist down the road. I'm writing to, to tell people that the money we use every day, day in and day out, is changing right before our eyes. 
The next decade is going to see so much change in financial services and more importantly in money itself than we've seen in, in changes in money in, in a century or certainly several generations or more. And, and that money is becoming decentralized, it's becoming tokenized, it's becoming borderless, and it's becoming digital. And we're really in a battle right now for what values is that money going to carry with it? Is it going to carry the values that we've accustomed, we're accustomed to in our democracies, values of the rule of law, uh, values of economic independence and economic um, um, uh, uh, privacy, or will it carry other values like government surveillance or, or, or commercial exploitation, and more importantly, the ability to censor, censor our use of that money? So that's the fight for the future of money that I talk about in my book, and I've written this for everybody to understand that this change is coming and the time to speak up and make sure that the right values the social norms that we expect in a democracy are imprinted in that digital money that's coming very, very soon. So that's a fascinating high level view. And it is such an exciting message. And indeed, one of the things I noticed in your book, you quoted uh, Sir John Cunliffe, who's the deputy governor of the Bank of England. And he was talking about every few generations, there's a kind of debate about money. But certainly, I mean, you know, you and I have been around the block for a number of years. I can't remember anything like the debate over the future of money that we've been enduring in the course of the last three, four, five years. It's quite sensational. A absolutely. You know, up until uh, the early 20th century, most money was was benchmarked to a commodity. Yep. And that commodity was gold. And then after World War II, the world decided they're going to benchmark value of money around the world to a form of money. That is the U.S. dollar. And, you know, benchmarking global currencies to one currency is a relatively modern idea. M throughout most of history, it has been benchmarked to a commodity. And so it raises some really interesting um, thoughts here as we go to a world where we now have di digital commodities like benchmark, like, uh, like a Bitcoin. Do we remain in a world where the world's values are continue to be benchmarked to the dollar? Or could we see a time where they become, because perhaps of loss of value of the dollar through inflation or other things, could they become benchmarked once again to a commodity, but not an earth commodity, not a natural commodity, but maybe a digital commodity? Isn't that an interesting concept? It's so fascinating. And I mean, this is something that I talked about in Capital Market Revolution even 20 odd years ago in terms of being able to value against assets and having very rapidly tradable digital currencies, digital assets, and so on. And you've brought that out in your book. But let's take a step back a little bit, because I, I got to say, I loved the layout of the book. Um, personally, of course, as you mentioned, I'm a car guy, and uh, you're a car guy too. And you gave us really genuinely a book that's a road trip. I, I think the movie has got to be something very exciting in the near future. And, and you break it up into these really interesting sections, starting with your own personal history. Because you began, I mean, a far from the madding crowd of digital currency on your career path. Absolutely right. You know, we all bring to our life experiences those background issues. And so I wanted to, to lay out for, for folks sort of my own unique story. Um, you know, my ancestors coming to America, my, my parents exceeding their parents' expectations and their and my parents' expectations for their own children to go into this world and bring something of, of that experience to bear. But also, like you mentioned, I'm a car guy and I see so much of life as very much of a journey. You know, it's an iterative journey. You learn from experiences you've had and, and you build on that, just as when you set out on a road journey, you know, roads lead into it. And I begin the book actually with lyrics from a song that I wrote back in, in high school with, with a friend of mine about a road journey, because very much I think that journey, as we call it, down the rabbit hole of cryptocurrency is one that we all come to in a unique way until we have that eureka moment that, wow, money really is changing. And, and, and you, know, you know, I talk a lot about the changes that the Internet has wreaked to the information uh, uh, economy, the information world, and how, you know, uh, intermediaries like Kodak that we all depended on at one point in time to acquire film, to develop film, to be able to make uh, film transferable and visible, viewable by others is gone. We, we, the internet has completely transformed that. Now we send a photograph around the world in a second. And yet for some reason, we still expect 
that the money we we've known for generations is not going to itself be changed by the internet i think it's it's naive to believe that the way the internet has changed photography the way the internet has changed information the way the internet has changed uh, retail shopping is not going to have the same dramatic transformational impact on financial services and money itself i think it's completely naive to believe that in fact i i think the right answer is it's going to be as transformational if not more on financial services and money and those of us that are seeing that i think have a duty to let our fellow citizens know that it's time for a free society to speak up and make sure the values they expect in money make sure they're encoded in that new form of digital money that's certainly coming it's a super point altogether. I mean, actually, if I just hold on a second. No, um, you were stating something about the change towards photography, and I think that encapsulates it. I mean, the selfie culture that we've got at the moment and the way, as you say, modern modern money is essentially something that evolves from a period in time when people were still standing behind things on tripods that took a minute to expose and you had to wear a curtain over your head in order to make sure that you didn't blank the negative. And even if you look at post-war money, I, I mean, the, the so post-Bretton Woods money, we're still talking about a very, very analog post-box brownie, but nonetheless mechanical-like era. It's and, really, and Patrick, really... Let me just pick up on that point. Talk about you know, it. The, the, so... so so photography changed in the way you could just take that photograph and send it to me or anywhere across the globe in a second, right? That was the first order impact. But the second order impact is the way people now can attend an event or see an incident and videotape it. And a second later, it's on YouTube, which may cause all kinds of social movements or, or protests or others to follow that. So so there's a first order impact, that the, te yep. the, the sheer technological change, and then there's the social impact. And so, you know, I think right now, those of us that are proponents for the digital future of money or profits of it are pointing out that technological change. But what's completely unforeseen and unforeseeable is what the social impact of that will be. And that's something that, you know, all our children will see and experience. But I, I'm certain it's going to be as dramatic as what the selfie and, and the and the and the video tape, the video clip. Uh, of of real life in real time has how how has changed society. Well, I mean, absolutely. And you think about well, you know, where we were early in our careers. We both worked for interdealer brokers at one point in time, and you look at how that was an archaic system. I mean, you had bits of paper that got stamped and franked with a timestamp and you wrote on them and you stamped them again and then you telephoned somebody and so on. But the actual data trail that was encoded ended up being the square root of nothing in the, in, I mean, as far into the mid 1990s. Whereas you look at now, the third order magnitude is not just the social effect, it's the total stream of data that suddenly says, on 100 million networks, it can say, Patrick Young is in the beautiful by nature Providencialis in the Turks and Caicos, and he's talking to Christopher Giancarlo, who's in upstate New York. And, and then you get this enormous amount of information, which, as you pointed out, can be used for nefarious means by a government or another actor, as well as being used for good to simply say, wow, you're in Providencialis. Why don't you go to the cafe around the corner when you need a coffee after a hard-earned discussion with, with Christopher Giancarlo, the crypto dad? And it's really, really interesting how that generates. So actually, one of the things I loved in your book was how you've broken down the multiplicity of different functions in the world. And you've noted how technology takes place. And you had a beautiful story about flying out to the Midwest and looking, meeting a farmer. And he was telling you he'd just cut his hard red wheat field. But he'd obviously done it in the middle of the night. And, and I think that was a great use of technology. It was really interesting. Yeah, that, that was a fact. That was, you know, one of those moments where the light bulbs go off that the world really is changing. Um, so is, it, the CFTC oversees most of the world's key commodity uh, derivative markets. And they're key not only because they allow people that have risk in the price of those commodities, but also it's where the pricing actually takes place. The world price for cotton is set in U.S. derivative markets. The world price for oil, as we know, is set in, in U.S. markets, in, in the derivative markets, not in the spot markets. And it's a point that I established very, for a very important reason in my book is because if we, if we get it right, the world price for crypto could be uh, set 
in, in deep and liquid U.S. derivative markets. But uh, the eureka moment was I flew down to uh, uh, Bardwell, Texas, which is about an hour and a half uh, south of, of Dallas, to visit a cotton farmer because I really wanted to understand better the process of cotton production, how a cotton gin works, how cotton is sold, et cetera, et cetera. Part of my duties as, as, as chairman of an agency to better understand the antecedents of a lot of the products we oversee. And as we were driving in his pickup truck out to, to go to visit the local cotton gin, we passed by a field and this was like March or so. Um, and I noticed the field had just been cut. And so just chatting along with, with the farmer, I said, I see that that field's been cut. Um, is, is that winter wheat? Uh, because I just, you know, it's, it's just the winter's ending. So it must be winter wheat. And he said, yeah, we cut it last night. And then we're just riding along and I'm thinking about that. And suddenly it hit me. You cut it at night, you know, being sort of very analog in my thinking. I said, how, how could that be? And he said, oh, you want to see something cool? He pulls his truck over. Now, this is like a 20-year-old truck and the farmers in blue jeans and overalls. You know, you think this is the last person to be totally di uh, digitally networked. He pulls out his iPhone. He gives it a couple of swipes and he hands it to me. He says, check this out. And in it, I see oh, mostly black. But I see what looks like headlights moving along. And it's, it's clearly shot from the top looking down. And another set of headlights next to it. And I said, look, I can't make heads or tail of what this, what is this? And he said, well, the one on the left is my tractor and it's pulling uh, uh, a, a cart. And on the one on the other side of it is my, is my, is my uh, harvester. It's my, my combine. And I'm in, in the, the tractor, my son's in the combine. He's cutting the wheat and it's, and it's using vehicle telemetry to, to keep them close by side by side. And the, the combine is being guided by GPS and the whole video is being shot by my drone. And I said, so let me get this right. You and your son cut this entire field in the dead of night. And he said, yeah. And I thought to myself, wow. I mean, if you think about agriculture, farming, since the dawn of civilization has been a daylight activity and it's been a labor intensive activity. Now, because of precision farming, because of GPS, because of basically exponential digital technology, two people can harvest an entire field in the middle of the night without reams of, of farm hands and uh, without the daylight necessary to conduct farming. Farming is now a 24-7 activity that can be done with a minimal amount of human uh, labor. I mean, that is a huge transformational change. And I learned a lot more about what's now called precision farming during my time at the CFTC. The, the amount of efficiencies that, that the digital technology has brought to farming. I'll give you one other example. There are now land-based drones that can move along furrows in a field and use photo cells to identify precisely the weeds that are growing and then mix the exact precise chemical compound to micro spray that weed and not the crops only in order to control weeds. Now, we think about it for the technology we've used for the last century is crop dusters, yep. which spray pesticide on everything, the good crops and the bad crops, right? The good crops and the weeds. Now we can target just the weeds precisely and actually, you know, create better natural organic crops without pesticides. It's amazing what this technology is doing to farming. And the light bulb that went off for me was, well, if farming is moving from, you know, an analog pre-20th century uh, means of, of production and harvesting to a digital future, to think that the same impact is not going to ha happen to every other aspect of our life, including the most basic one of all, which is money, I think, again, is naive. It's happening. It's going to happen. The fight for the future money is taking place today. And it's, it requires all of us to be involved in that change, to make sure the change is one that's salutary to a free society and not, not corrosive of individual liberty. Absolutely. I'm sorry about that jet ski in the background. It might have been slightly drowning you out. It certainly wasn't precision farming. It was very imprecision riding of a, of a, a vehicle on the water. But you brought back great summer memories, Patrick. <laughs> I loved every minute of the jet ski.
<laughs> yeah, it's absolutely, it's absolutely delightful altogether. It's such a nice hashtag first world problem to have. We're here in uh, the beautiful by nature Turks and Caicos Islands today in Providenciales, speaking to Christopher Giancarlo, the uh, former chairman of the CFTC. His book, Crypto Dad, is out today. And it's a fantastic book, ladies and gentlemen. I recommend it wholeheartedly. You've got to get out there and get a copy. One of the things I love, and precision farming is a very good example, is lots of great little sidebars. So when you get to the chapter that starts talking about the swaps market, you don't have to have a hissy fit. You don't have to go along another 10 pages and try and find something that you're going to find a lot easier to explain. Beautiful little breakout boxes there that explain in simple layman, laywoman's language for everybody how these things work and what they're doing. The, the agricultural point, I think, is absolutely well made, um, Chris, and I really love it because, I mean, one of the other things you can actually do now in the in your John Deere, that's John Deere who used to be a tractor company but now call themselves an agricultural technology manufacturer. I do believe they've even got them linked to Bloomberg screens and linked to exchanges. And you can actually measure the amount of wheat that you're harvesting at the time you're harvesting it, and it'll tell you roughly the quality of what you're pr pulling out. So you can actually hedge it while you're still sitting in your cab. Uh, absolutely incredible. And also the, the, the social impacts, extending the lifetime of farmers because they don't have to do so much physical work. So you can work on a farm into your 70s and 80s. And that's actually helping a lot of farmers in the USA in particular who have been really the early adopter here. It's sensational. And that brings us all the way around to money. So on the journey, and by the way, I compliment you, you had a lovely quotation from, I think it was Track Rod magazine in the early 1970s from Michael Coston, who's, who's a genius of cars. For those of you who are interested in Formula One, you'll all remember the Cosworth Formula One engine. Well, he was the cause of Cosworth. Talk to us a little bit about how in this, before we get to the outright skirmishes and the guerrilla warfare of the battle for money that we're coming to in a few minutes' time, you get to the CFTC. Tell us a little bit, of, a bit about how that journey and how Washington kind of impacted your thinking, because you talk about that in the book. Well, I'll tell you what, it was an honor to be asked by President Obama to serve at the CFTC. And, and I went there after uh, a decade and a half on Wall Street um, uh, operating one of the uh, world's premier uh, trading venues for over-the-counter swaps. And I, I became a proponent of what became the reforms to the swaps market that were embedded in the Dodd-Frank Act because of my own experience in the financial crisis in 2008. My firm, GFI Group, had grown into the world's largest um, a marketplace for market makers in a type of swap called the credit default swap. And, uh, and I explain what credit default swaps are in the book and why they're important. They're basically the bellwether as to the credit quality of major financial institutions interacting with other financial institutions. And in 2008, as the crisis was building, um, I was getting calls from officials at the New York Federal Reserve asking me what we were seeing in the marketplace. And I was telling them, well, we're seeing a, you know, very dramatic changes in the credit quality of some of the biggest names. Um, the, what's called the spread, the cost to insure against default by a Lehman Brothers was going up during the course of a given day quite dramatically, which meant that there was basically fear and loathing on Wall Street as to the ability of that financial institution to survive. And the officials at the Fed said to me, wow, that's fascinating. Uh, we'd like to understand more. Can you swing around to the Federal Reserve? And at those days, our offices were at 100 Wall Street. The Federal Reserve was a block or so away on Maiden Lane. And I said, sure, but I said, we are in a crisis mode on the trading floor, trying to maintain orderly markets. I'll try to swing by, but maybe I won't get there till eight or nine o'clock tonight. And, and this was two days before Lehman fell. And the federal official said, oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm way too busy tonight. In fact, I've got a kid's soccer game. Why don't you pull out your diary? Let's look. Maybe there's a date in October. Now, we're talking October 2008 uh, that we can get together. I said, sure. But the way the markets are moving right now, I, I don't know whether some of these banks will be around in October. But sure, I'll come by then. We may have plenty of time to have a coffee then. So it was clear to me that the federal government had no better visibility into the credit quality of some of the world's most important financial institutions than to call around to shops like mine and say, remind us what you guys do again. And do you have a few time, a few minutes to have a cup of coffee? 
it, it, I became a proponent for the greater market transparency that Dodd-Frank required. I became a, a supporter. In fact, I have been a supporter for a number of years of central clearing of swaps products because actually with some of my colleagues, we had begun the launch of the first clearinghouse for, for swaps products. And I was a, a proponent for the activities that were being done by firms like mine be actually properly licensed. I thought it would bring a greater professionalism to it. So in 2010, when the Dodd-Frank bill was, was passed, I put out a public statement commending President Obama for that achievement and, and the Congress. And in 2013, when a seat opened up on the commission, I was honored to receive an invitation uh, and a nomination to join the commission, and I did. I, the last, I, I went there to work on swaps reform. I didn't go there to focus on crypto. Um, uh, it was something that was in my sort of distant, distant um, uh, knowledge base, but it really wasn't why I went into government. Um, and then it started to build. And in 2015, uh, I started talking to some folks that were developing crypto. Uh, and, and it started really, uh, my knowledge base started growing. And a couple of other things happened. One of the things that happened when I was at the commission as a, my, as a commissioner, not as chairman, from the period of 2014 until 2017, is I started realizing that regulatory agencies were so backward looking. It, you know, it, I use the phrase in the book that, that um, war, uh, the peacetime generals spend their time fighting the last war and, and peacetime economists spend their time fighting the last depression. Well, the fact of the matter is peacetime regulators are, are obsessed with the last market crisis and are not sufficiently looking ahead to the next one. And, and you know, you mentioned John Deere. One, I remember one meeting I had with officials from uh, you, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and, and I was asking them how they calculate uh, f uh, farm yields that go into some of their uh, crop protection programs and others insurance crop insurance programs, which the CFTC helps supply them with information. And they explain that they use some information that we provide and some information that they gather themselves by actually calling around to large uh, agriculture producers. And I said to them, well, do you use any of this John Deere data? Because you mentioned John Deere as a precision technology manufacturer. John Deere is actually quickly becoming a data company. Why is that? Yeah. Because all of these precision tractors are gathering data and beaming it up to the satellite. And John Deere is creating enormous databases of agriculture production. And these guys from the USDA said to me, oh, no, no, no. That data is way too good. It's much better than anything we have. We don't have access to that data. <laughs> so, 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 so the fact of the world is the private sector is always moving so much farther ahead of the regulators. And so I thought, well, if, gosh, gosh, if I ever became chairman of this agency, I'm going to get us, I'm going to take that huge rear view mirror that's stuck on our windshield. I'm going to take it off and say, look forward, everybody. Let's stop focusing on 2008. Let's start seeing what's coming down the road. And so um, to, to my surprise, uh, Donald Trump was elected president, and to my even greater delight, he appointed Gary Cohn, the former uh, uh, chief executive of Goldman Sachs, as his director of the National Economic Council. Now, I knew Gary going back uh, to, to my days on Wall Street. Uh, Goldman Sachs was an important client of my firm. He was uh, the representative. I knew him. So within days of he being picked for that job, he gave me a call and said, hey, how are you doing? Um, do you like what you're doing? Are you happy in it? If you were to become chairman, what would you do? And I talked to him about this. We've got to take a forward looking view. We've got to start as a regulator, start using some of these new technologies ourselves, uh, machine learning, pattern recognition, big data analysis. We've got to get some of these data sets. We've got to better understand it. And we've got to start preparing for the digitalization of financial markets. And he said, wow, I really like that approach. I'm going to have a word with the president elect. And he called me back and he said, look, he doesn't need to interview you. If you want the job, you're going to be chairman. The only thing I ask from you is we'll get you sworn in on day one. You've got to hit the ground running. He said the objectives are job creation and economic growth, job creation, economic growth. And, I, and every time I, in my book, I recount in my interactions with the administration, it was always those two mantras, job creation, economic growth. And pretty much they left me alone at the agency. I went forward with a very forward-looking, uh, technology-driven uh, agenda. 
In, in, in the spring of 2017, we launched Lab CFTC, which is meant to be our internal stakeholder in the digitization of markets. And we appointed a really dynamic leader, a guy named Daniel Gorfine, to head it up. And immediately, we started doing an analysis of crypto. And this is even before any of the large exchanges in the U.S. approached us about greenlighting Bitcoin futures. We had begun an analysis process. In fact, we began a process where every Friday there'd be a presentation on a basket of key commodities overseen by the CFTC. And we made Bitcoin part of that basket. We actually did a tabletop exercise where we did some Bitcoin mining synthetically, but we did Bitcoin mining in the chairman's office with all commissioners present and members of the senior staff to understand what was involved in it. And that was back in 2017. So we were really trying to get ahead of the curve and turn things from a backward looking focus to a forward-looking focus. And I think that prepared us well when those applications came in in the summer and fall of 2017 by the CBOE and the CME, Chicago Mercantile Exchange, to uh, launch Bitcoin Futures, which successfully launched in December of that year. I think that's fascinating altogether. I'm going to give you just a couple of seconds. I'm, I'm going to just talk to the audience here. I'm sure you need a little drink. I, I noticed that beautiful silver roadster you have over your shoulder with the crypto dad picture behind it. Everybody needs a pit stop now and again. I'm here with the crypto dad. He's uh, crypto dad talks today. The Honorable Jay Christopher Jan Carlo. We're talking about his new book, Crypto Dad, which is the fight for the future of money. It's out today. You can get it on Amazon.com and in bookstores across the world. It is a must read, ladies and gentlemen. If you don't understand Bitcoin, you don't understand swaps, you're terrified of the concept of agricultural futures. This is actually a great book for you because it's a super road trip, a journey that you can manage to understand what's going on and appreciate what is happening in the future of finance. And at the end of the day, everything in life in some way or another boils down to money, even in the paradisical Turks and Caicos Islands. We're here today in Providencialis looking over the silly creek where you can hear a hive of activity in the background as the property boom continues and people are busy building for the future. So, Christopher, I mean, it's really interesting. You're talking there about, you know, central bankers. You're talking about regulators always looking in the rear view mirror. I love the point about the fact that, yes, the regulators and their economists are always looking towards the last crash, not the current one. And indeed, uh, I applaud you because, I mean, we just had John Cunliffe, who was mentioned earlier in this discussion from the Bank of England, saying there's now an urgency over what we've got to do with cryptocurrency. And I've got to say, I, I, look, I looked at that and I sort of thought, yes, well, if you haven't been listening for 20 years, then there is an urgency all of a sudden, whereas, you know, CFTC under your chairmanship, you were looking at this for four or five years. Explain to me, where did the first kind of interactions politically take place in Washington, D.C.? Thanks, Patrick. And by the way, uh, thanks for that pit stop. As they say in Formula One, it was a, it was a, a splash and dash. <laughs> to grab a sip and, 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 and jump back in. So, so well, I, I recount a lot of those stories in my book. You know, for someone even not interested in crypto, but might be interested to hear how decisions get made at the highest levels on some important issues, I think you might find my book interesting because I detail some of those. And what's remarkable is how, how ad hoc, how random some of those decisions, some of those choices are made. And I also explained that the Trump administration never had a formal policy, either stated or unstated, which about crypto, which allowed regulatory heads like myself to call it as we see it, to follow within the traditions of our agency, but within our own uh, judgment as to what's the right course. And so uh, there was no effort to stop the CFTC once we decided to green light Bitcoin futures. But there was a lot of sniping around the edges, both in Washington and around the world. And I recall uh, just a story that just after we greenlighted Bitcoin in, in futures in the United States, notwithstanding full page ads in the Wall Street Journal uh, uh, urging me not to go forward with it or not go forward with it as designed, uh, notwithstanding letters from some of the major trade associations demanding that we slow things down and go slower, and notwithstanding you know uh, really um, uh, snide uh, um, articles in some press publications saying that we were grandstanding, et cetera, et cetera. So there was some sniping around the edges, but we went forward anyway. And a, a, a few weeks later, uh, I was attending a regularly scheduled meeting of the Financial Stability Board in Basel. And for people that don't know, the Financial Stability Board 
is the, the holy of the holies. It's the great intersectum of where important decisions get made for the global financial system. It's, it's a board that was set up by the G20 after the last financial crisis. It contains the, the central bankers and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the government treasury officials and, 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 and of all the world's major economies. And, and these are not people that are elected. These are people that are appointed at the highest level and, and they meet in, in, in a remarkable um, uh, 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 building, inner sanctum. Uh, it, I describe it as something out of a James Bond movie. Um, and, and there, um, I, I was asked to explain the CFTC's decision to greenlight Bitcoin futures. And, and I think this is one of the really uh, fun reads in the book um, because it, it, it's, I describe the different attitudes, mostly negative, by central bankers. Why is that? Because central bankers' primary job is to defend their reserve currency status of their currency. And so many of them view crypto as, as either a real or a potential threat to what they're doing. And so there's real nervousness about crypto. And I also explain in the book that up to this time, for 10 years, society has been experimenting with money and central bankers have paid it little mind. Now, all of a sudden, they immediately find themselves in, a, in what I call a fight or flight moment, whether to squelch this new innovation, as China seems to be doing, um, or to pretend it isn't there, as some are doing, or to accelerate their own efforts to develop digital currency, as I believe uh, responsible central banks should, but not to the exclusion of private sector development. In fact, as I say in the book, it, the, 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 the official sector has a lot to learn from the private sector and ought to actually hold in respect what the private sector has done. Anyway, read the book to find out how that meeting in, in Basel, Switzerland went. I think folks will find it pretty uh, 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 fun and informative about how decisions are made and at the highest levels of government. It's, it's not as um, uh, perhaps as, as, as disciplined and, and, and structured and, and dry as you might think. There's a lot of emotion involved, even at these uh, august uh, decision-making and rule-setting bodies. I agree. It's a fantastic passage. It, it reads like a Tom Clancy novel, but it was real life. And just like the new James Bond film, in case you haven't seen it yet, I'm not going to give away what was the ending to that whole discussion. You need to buy Crypto Dad, the, uh, the fight for the future of money, and read that itself. And certainly it's fascinating, as you say, that the fight or flight mode that's suddenly taken over in the central banking organization, where until a number of years ago, they really didn't care. I mean, people gave out vouchers and bits and pieces. That didn't really bother them whatsoever if you were getting you know, something at your gas station that gave you a free car wash. Nowadays, you tokenize it and suddenly you find yourself in line with all sorts of regulators who are attacking and want to know what's going on. And, and another and point, to that point, it, it, to, hold that, but to that point, I found it remarkable the recent statement from some senior officials at the Bank for International Settlement said, uh, "Stable coins are not a game changer." I mean, holy cow, they're not a game changer. Every central bank in the world is trying to develop a digital currency, yeah. which was something they weren't even talking about two years ago. It's because stable coins are succeeding so successfully, are moving so much money around the world at low cost, instantaneously, in a borderless way, that the central banks of the world, the, the, the heretofore uh, controllers of those payment systems and of that payment system framework are suddenly saying, we need to accelerate these efforts. Yes, yeah, stablecoins are a game changer, and the evidence is the acceleration of efforts by central banks to move forward. Now, I'm a supporter of those efforts, but to say that it's not a game changer, you know, it, it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, somebody doth protest too much, I think. <laughs> it, it's absolutely a game changer. At the same time, I can see there are clearly a large number of bureaucrats around the world who wake up in the morning and they see their pensions flashing in front of their eyes in terror at what this newfangled money can do. And you're right. I mean, we talked, what, just a few months ago before summer, and you look at how much has changed even since then. I mean, the central bank digital currency, well, this week we've got the e Naira coming from Nigeria, not something that probably it matters much to Western investors, but a great thing in order to try and help on gum, what is an economy which is already largely cashless and using mobile technology for a lot of transactions? We've seen the the incredible moves. Well, we were in the Bahamas just two weeks ago, my wife and I, and there the central bank, they've got the sand dollar. Why have they got the sand dollar? Because the Bahamian dollar, even though it's pegged to the US dollar, is traditionally difficult to get money in and out of. So sand dollar becomes a transactional thing. 
And also you hit upon something I just made me think about it was, good grief, we talked two, three months ago and look at how the world's changed. At that point in time, the big worry was China was about to dominate the world of cryptocurrency mining and therefore the West would be essentially a satellite of whatever got mined in China. And now this week, I read in the South China Morning Post just a day or so ago that the not only has the crackdown been incredible, but actually there's a governmental body that simply said that as far as they're concerned, cryptocurrency mining is an industry that they want to see removed from the shores of China. Quite incredible the speed this stuff is moving at, Chris. Absolutely. And I, I take that as the ultimate expression of what I call in my book, the, the central bankers fight or flight moment. I, I, China's done both, Right. Uh, they, they're fighting by suppressing uh, uh, non-sovereign cryptocurrency production at, at China, but they're flighting because what they're doing is usurping the great lead in digital payments that Alipay and WeChat Pay are, have started by stepping in their shoes for their own creation, the digital yuan. So China is, is, is if nothing proves the success of, of, of digital tokenized payment systems, it's China's moves to suppress it because it yep. basically saying is it's so good we're going to own it in the form of digital digital yuan. It's such an innovative idea that we want to take it over and run with it and be the exclusive provider of it within China. So that's fascinating. So you talk about the subtitle of your book, Crypto Dad, is the fight for the future of money. You're looking at this whole thing. But it's a multifaceted battle, isn't it? I mean, from the China angle, the U.S. angle, and how this goes around the world. It's a multifaceted battle. The players are central banks, central governments, the, the private sector, including big, big tech, big banking, the big banks and, and the legacy infrastructure that had some vested interest in the old world, but also see the opportunity of the new world. The players are underbanked populations, under under ID'd population that have been excluded from the old system because the old system requires identity in every case. And anywhere between a billion to two billion of the eight billion people on this planet don't have sufficient identity to participate in that case. And and the the, the other player in this, the player that I'm hoping to reach with my book, is the broad middle of, of our free market economy, of our, of our free society, the people who rely on a degree of economic independence, of, of, of economic privacy, that have enjoyed that in the money of our de democratic systems for a long time, and to say to them, folks, you've got to engage. You cannot take for granted that the privacy you enjoy in a fiat money system will be the privacy you'll enjoy in a, in, a, in a digital monetary system of the future. We've got to insist that those values that got us here are the values that our children are going to enjoy when their money is digital. And so th there's so many groups, there's so many blocks involved in what this fight is going, is, is shaping up are, but it's happening now. Message to folks, understand that fight and engage in that fight. And, and, and I wrote my book for you understand we cannot take anything for granted, certainly not our economic privacy in the future. And ladies and gentlemen, let me just once again say, you got to buy this book. Crypto Dad is an absolutely great read. It's gripping. It's interesting. There's politics in it, which you'll find interesting about the Beltway, I thought was very interesting. There's an enormous amount of insights and other, and other issues. And, and really, Crypto Dad talks today. It's great on the launch day of this book, Chris. Thank you so much for joining us. But you know, what I can't help feel is just behind you in your office, you've got that door and we can see your Crypto Dad book framed on the on the right hand side, the cover. I get that feeling that when you open that door, there's some sort of massive war room behind you. But it's not like <laughs> World War Two. You know, we're used to all of those movies where you've always got those ladies who would be standing around a desk and they'd be moving with big, long sticks, these sort of aircraft and ships around the theater of war. This is really multidimensional. I mean, this battle for the future of money, because you've got skirmishes happening in small stages. You've got local regulators. You've got international regulators, the central banks. It's an incredibly difficult to see quite how all of this is going to resolve itself in such a fast moving marketplace. I agree. But, you know, I, I, one of the things I love about free society, love about democratic society is democratic societies don't move forward in a linear 
organized passion, uh, uh, fashion. In fact, the reason I use the road theme as the theme for my book is roads meander. Roads go on and they, they go through turning points and then they settle down and they go through other junctions and they go over mountains. And democracies evolve in the same way. And every generation has got to re-battle um, for its values, lest those values be usurped by politicians and others. And I don't spare politicians uh, you know, a critical view in my book, because free society has to fight against sometimes politicians, against against big industry for those very values. And so the road goes on and, and we won't necessarily it won't necessarily be a clean path. It won't be as as in a sense linear as China's doing, because that's not how we roll in free societies. The debate is going to wait, rage. And, and when I'm, it's a call to arms. It's a call to arms to people that value their economic liberty to stand up. The money is changing. It's, it's, you cannot fight technology. It is going to happen. So the question is, do we do we harness it in a way that 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 makes the movement of money lower cost, more inclusive, faster, turbocharges our economy, creates new industries, creates new opportunities, brings more people into economic uh, uh, services and economic opportunities? Or do we simply sit back and let this wave of the internet overwhelm us and, and perhaps vested interests, large technology, governments that want our information? Let's not forget the, government, the United States government right now is talking about having access to every transaction we do over six hundred dollars. The government right now is is it, you know I, I've heard that forty percent forty percent of the money in circulation today has been produced in the last two and a half years. I, I, I I'd like to find a site for that, but I've heard that these are these are not necessarily actions that are conducive to economic liberty, economic stability, and so. The battle is taking place today and, and free people everywhere have to play a role in that to make sure the values, as I say, that got us here are the values that will be here for our children and our grandchildren. There is a fight underway for the future of money and the, the time to engage in that fight is now. That's so interesting because you've talked a lot about the, the generational success, which is, let's face it, a watchword of the United States of America. Each generation has been successively more prosperous, but we do seem to be at an incredible cusp, a turning point where a lot is happening. I couldn't help but notice even your historical statistic, which I hadn't realized. I mean, you were talking about the, the, the extent of bureaucracy and regulation. And I think it was like 12.5% of all business cost was essentially regulation, even dating back to the Obama era when you first stepped up to the the CFTC those are those are staggering numbers and obviously new money potentially threatens the ability of uh, the old money providers the central banks to be as profligate as some may have been in recent years so looking at the book itself tell me what's the part of it that you're most excited about or most proud of in terms of the crypto dad well you know we as I said, the decision to greenlight Bitcoin futures uh, was one that we knew would have long term ramifications. And there was a fair amount of subtle and, and, and a pressure to delay it or defer it or avoid it. Uh, there was political risk in making that decision. And yet in making the decision to trust markets to 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 be the the value the that to establish the value of this new innovation and not to assert ourselves as unelected bureaucrats to us to to uh, put a value on this but to leave it to markets took political courage it, it took it, it hazarded political risk but in so doing it actually decreased regulatory risk for the marketplace. It allowed a market to evolve and develop. And that market has now been going for four years. And during that period of time, people have looked to the CFTC for regulatory clarity, for regulatory intelligence, what I call market intelligence in the book. And so sometimes uh, uh, public figures and regulators need to take political risk in order to de-risk uh, markets and mm -hmm. enterprise. And I think that is the, perhaps the, the moment that I'm most proud of. And I look at the, the, the Bitcoin ecosystem today, I look at the crypto ecosystem today, its maturity level, the, 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 the ecosystem that has evolved of, of, of 
execution of market making of 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 of, um, uh, of, 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 uh, of professional money investment uh, of insurance engagement of portfolio management you, you see a, a rapidly maturing ecosystem and that would not have happened had we not had the political courage to green light Bitcoin futures back in 2017 so sometimes when, when leaders are willing to brave the political risk in order to de-risk an environment, healthy economic activity results as part of that. So if I'm, I'm proud of something, I'm proud of that. And I go into great detail in the book to explain the, the pressures on us to, to hinder that innovation and why we stood tall and went forward with it. And something I think has contributed directly to the, the success of crypto and eventually to central banks and governments recognizing the success of this innovation and now looking to develop their own avenues of crypto. And I think also, I mean, I applaud you for that foresight because the other thing that has happened is for several years, people have been throwing brickbats at the futures exchange who pioneered their futures contracts under the CFTC's regime. But actually, we're reaching a fascinating tipping point now because the likes of the CME Bitcoin futures are becoming the price benchmark, not these unregulated, arguably rather more dubious, certainly not subjected to the kind of high quality rationale regimes of regulation, such as the CME, SIBO et al, who've produced their futures. And that's a very good move because it's almost like the OTC move into CCP, into central counterparty clearing. It's giving a lot of credibility to that market. Absolutely. I mean, I, I must say I take some degree of personal satisfaction that the SEC, which for the last four years wasn't willing to take much political risk in terms of uh, uh, giving leeway to this innovation to move forward, has now decided to go forward with its first basically regulated marketplace for a, a, a crypto product in the case of Bitcoin ETFs. But they're doing it by allowing it to be based upon that regulated market that we initiated four years ago. So it's vindication, the choices we made that our sister agency, the SEC, would use that mark as a basis. Now, putting my personal satisfaction aside, uh, I am concerned about a product that's effectively a derivative on a der derivative. There's a lot of basis uh, risk inherent in that. There's, there's, some, there's going to be arbitrage. There's going to be other aspects of that. Some of these we anticipated in, in, during my time at the CFTC. In meetings with the SEC, we talked about if they were to launch an ETF, what that might look like, the need for perhaps a revised position limits, uh, the, 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 what the demand might look like, how that might work. So some of the very issues that I understand the CFTC and the SEC and its changes are working through now is some of the issues that we anticipated back then. Um, ultimately, I do think that there's going to be demand for an ETF based upon the underlying spot markets. And that's going to present some challenges because, as I explained in my book, Spot markets for uh, non-securities based, basically commodity based crypto are unregulated under under our existing regime. Now, remember, the existing regulatory regime in the United States was not written for crypto. It was written 90 years ago in the 1930s for a completely different world. We do not have today a crypto native regulatory regime. We have regimes that people like me have evolved to, to adapt to this technology but they're not crypto native. They have many shortcomings and many limitations. We do need, as I explained in my book, the, the Congress, the representatives of the people to identify what is the U.S. public policy in the Internet of value, in crypto, in Bitcoin and, and in central bank digital currency. I think those imperatives and my, my, I, I express in this book have to be, yes, investor protection. Yes, orderly and, and, and liquid and deep, uh, well-regulated markets and a national imperative in furthering innovation and seeing innovation happen in a in a in a in a, in a uh, with, without a, without a constant regulatory jeopardy that innovators know where they can they can move forward in a way that they're not going to be subject to regulatory risk or undue regulatory risk. If we can establish those principles and if Congress can lay down a sensible approach, and I talk about some of these in my book, then I think the United States could become center, a center of innovation for what ultimately, and why, why do we want to do this? Patrick, the, this new innovation presents the opportunity for greater financial inclusion, lower cost, greater speed, 
less rent collection to move money around the world. It can send an economy that is, you know, question where our growth is right now, but it can send an economy where economic growth is generally a good thing for job creation and others. It can actually turbocharge our economy by lowering rent collection, improving the speed and velocity of money, if we get it right. But the only way to get it right is to have that national debate, to have the, the, the people's representatives in Congress lay down what those imperatives are and not leave it to unelected regulators to, in a sense, make it up as they go along. They can make it up as they go along for good, as I tried to do with the CFTC. They can make it up as they go along by simply not taking political risk and doing nothing, as has been done as well. I think the opportunity here is to have a national debate, inform Congress on this, and have them lay down some basic markers so we, the United States and, and the, the West generally, in Europe and elsewhere, can be a leader in this innovation. We want the democracies to lead in the future of money, not the autocracies, not, not the, the dictatorships. We want the, the, the democracies to lead in this innovation for the good of our people. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the manifesto of crypto dad and you know what i have to say there's an old maxim that you should listen to your parents well in this case when you're looking at the future of money as christopher giancarlo has said today money is changing value your economic liberty this is the opening of a great debate and i thoroughly recommend his new book it's published today october 26th crypto dad the fight for the future of money it's a super read it will be the ideal thing to Hand over to people if you're looking for gifts for Thanksgiving, for Christmas, for any other festival the world over. It is going to be a great movement forward for understanding and explaining how technology is interacting with you as well as what cryptocurrency is doing for you. And let's face it, I echo those. What are we looking for? We're looking for a better world with better money, with better inclusion, with lower costs, with faster speed of transactions. Good grief. I just moved some money the other day and it took four days to move some British pounds. No great distance around this earth, ladies and gentlemen. It certainly wasn't as far away as either upstate New York, where we've been speaking to J. Christopher Giancarlo today, or indeed the beautiful by nature Turks and Caicos Islands Providencialis, where I am today. What a fantastic show, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to wrap this up at this point in time. I'm going to say a huge thank you to Christopher Giancarlo. I'm going to let you get out on the road and take your absolutely wonderful and exciting message out there. It feels to me as if you're in max selection mode, actually, Chris, even though you're not running for any offices at this point in time. It's a super day, ladies and gentlemen, in this world. Go get yourselves a copy of Crypto Dad. Catch up with us next week. We're going to have the fabulous Peter Leonardo, a one-time analyst of the uh, of the parish, and now a man in the C-suite of various operations across time. He's going to be talking SPACs, market structure, much more in that show coming up. We'll be still in Providencialis as we run that particular show. All it remains for me to say, ladies and gentlemen, is thank you. J. Christopher Giancarlo, the former chairman of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, Crypto Dad. It's a great book, ladies and gentlemen. Get out there, get your copy, start reading. I wish you all a great week in life, Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, and markets. Chris, thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen.